Revelation 6, 14 through chapter 7, verse 2, has not been fulfilled. That's when the mountains are falling to the ocean and people go and hide themselves as they see Jesus coming a second time. But the Bible says that cannot happen until God has a people that have allowed him to seal them for security and preservation. Peter also says something about who the Holy Spirit is given to in Acts 5 and 32. And it says, that we are witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Spirit whom God hath given to them that obey. And Ray had just read, read a very interesting word. What does the word obey mean in the Bible? In the Bible. Cherish. I heard something. Cherish. Listen attentively. Listen attentively. Why? Because of what Mary Jane said. Cherish, guard, protect, appreciate. Subordinate. That's what the word obey really means. Submit or subordinate what? Your will to God's will. It is obvious, good morning, it is obvious that the Galatian Christians had received the Holy Spirit because they could not have begun their Christian life without it. Who would like to read Galatians chapter 3 verse 3? Volunteer. Okay, Patty? Are you so foolish of having done in the Spirit, or are you now being made perfect by the flesh? That's heavy. There's that word foolish again, and I'm not going to touch that anymore. I've already said enough. Paul is inspired, and I have no right to question his choice of words. Certainly slap the people around. You cannot possibly call anyone. I mean, you know, look, look it up for yourself. Jesus, what Jesus says in Matthew uh, 5, 22. Not now. Yeah. Look it up for yourself. Look it up. It's possible that the word foolish is really not strong enough to describe what these converts to Christianity in Galatia are doing. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul presented to them Jesus crucified in a way that they could see it with their own eyes. What else did we learn took place there? They what? Through the power of the Holy Spirit, they saw Miracles performed. And it suggested that they may have been used by the Holy Spirit to perform some of those miracles. Tell me, what is the state of mind, what is the mindset of a human being that does not have the power to begin something but now they believe that they can finish it. What is the mindset of a human being that recognizes, does not have the presence of mind or the strength to put one foot in front of the other, but now decides they're going to enter a race and expect to win it? That's what, that, that's what Paul is saying here. You began with no strength. I presented the gospel to you. You saw Jesus visually crucified. And now you're turning to someone else? Explain that to me, says Paul. You what? Foolish Galatians. Folks, we can no more live a righteous life in our own strength than we can beget ourselves. The work that the Holy Spirit has begun in us 
can only be completed through the Holy Spirit. Who would like to read Galatians chapter 3, verses 4 and 5? Come. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So there you have it. You've seen Jesus visually and you, with your own eyes crucified. <laughs> Miracles have been performed before you and very possibly through you. <coughs> through what? The gift of the Spirit. The gift of the Spirit or the gifts of the Spirit are also followed by, always followed by what? The gift of the Spirit. Performing miracles. In other words, the Galatian converts to Christianity have experienced the same thing that Jesus' disciples experienced. Same thing. In uh, Mark 6.13, we're told that Jesus' disciples were sent out two by two, and they performed what? So here we have Paul saying, the Holy Spirit has been manifested before you in such a way that miracles were performed before you and through you. What is it that you need to see or experience to get your attention that Jesus' crucifixion is the real deal? Is that a fair question to be asked of us? Yes. The root of the problem here must have something to do with pride. I believe that I'm seeking the truth on a daily basis because those who do not seek the truth will receive a delusion to believe any lie. And I believe that this is what was happening there in Galatia. Both answers are absolutely correct. The, the issue is that the converts to Christianity in Galatia, their disobedience is a disobedience to the law of God, which they were looking for to salvation. That'll spin your head around a little bit. That'll spin your head around just a little bit. Okay, who would like to read verse 6 of Galatians 3? Volunteer. Volunteer. Over here. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Thank you. So, Paul's labor among the Galatians, and their first experience with the gospel, was completely consistent with Abraham's experience. That's what Paul is saying here. Who did the false brethren claim as proof, or what did the, what did the false brethren claim as proof that they were Abraham's children? Circumcision. Circumcision. What was biblically wrong with the evidence that they were using that they, the false brethren, were children of Abraham. Not Let's take a look at it from Scripture. It's crucial that you understand this. Yes. Romans 4.11. We already looked at Ro Romans 4.11 a couple of weeks ago, but we need to look at it again. <clears throat> Volunteer to read Romans 4.11. Okay, Linda. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had while still circumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. What version are you reading from? New Kings. I think you got a word messed up. She did. She did. Yeah. She used circumcised instead of uncircumcised. Yeah, yeah. that's what threw it all over. 
You want to read that again for us, please? And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, ah, that he might be the father of all... Did I say circumcised there? Yeah. Sorry. That he might believe the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. Thank you. Is that better? I think that's biblically accurate. <laughs> Someone uh, said to me quietly after us, after the study, so, what's the big deal with circumcision? I mean, we, we, in the Protestant world, we don't teach circumcision. Right? What's the issue? I said, the issue is that circumcision is not the issue today, but the false brethren are still at work today. Amen. How are they at work today? Today, the perversion of the gospel is not circumcision, but good works produces righteousness. There you go. Another That's the perversion. So how should you and I biblically counter that perversion? That, righteous, that good works produces righteousness. Let's go to Romans 4 again. And who would like to read verses 2 and 3? And another, I need another volunteer for Genesis 15. Volunteer for Genesis 15. Let's go quick, folks. We have we don't have all the time. Three and four. Okay, and Genesis 15 over here. Go with Romans 4, 2, and 3. Alright. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now, Genesis 15, verse 6. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Thank you. So it's clear that Abraham was what? Declared righteous. Time-wise, in Genesis 15, 6, and when he was declared righteous, which is what she just read in Genesis 15, 6, he was declared righteous. Had he been circumcised no. as of Genesis 15, 6? No. He wasn't circumcised until Genesis 17. Do we understand that? Yes. The significance of that. According to Scripture, good works not, never has and never will be able to produce righteousness. Amen. Do we get that? Carl. Galatians 2, 21. Yep. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. And that is what's being taught today. In all Christian churches. <clears throat> in a tar and feather. Galatians 3, 7, and 8. Who would like to read that? Galatians 3, 7, and 8. We're going through Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. I need a volunteer real quick over here. Mary Jane. Galatians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. Therefore know that only those who are of the faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. Thank you. Understanding Galatians 3, 7, and 8 will save us a lot of headaches, a lot of errors, a lot of mistakes. What biblical evidence do we have as to when the gospel was first preached. When was the gospel first preached? I'm not talking about Genesis 3.15. When was the gospel first preached to a group of people? Amen. Go to Genesis chapter 12. I'm going to read Genesis chapter 12, two verses, and, I, and you're going to need the, hand, the fingers of two hands to count how many times, how many promises God makes to Abraham? Galatians chapter 12, beginning with verse 2. You ready? Got your hands ready? And I will make you a great nation. One. I will bless you. Two. And make your, your name great. Three. And so you shall be a blessing. Four. And I will bless you. Those who bless you, five. And those who curse you, I will curse, six. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. How many? Seven. Seven promises. 
That's the first time that God preached the gospel. Amen. Is God good on His promises? Amen. Good. So who first proclaimed the gospel to Abraham? God, God did. What should this mean to us? There's only one gospel, and that's God's gospel. Amen. What gospel did Paul preach? The Galatians. Same one. Same one. Same one that God preached to Abraham. We have no other gospel than the one that was preached to Abraham, and that Paul preached to Galatians. When God decided to have a first, his first evangelistic effort meeting to proclaim the gospel, what group of people did he choose to proclaim the gospel to? The heathen. The New Testament calls them Gentiles. Who would like to quickly look up Joshua 24, verse 2? Joshua 24, verse 2. What group of people did God choose to preach to in God's first evangelistic meeting? Joshua 24, verse 2. Who has it? Okay, Lois, please. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. So God shows the heathen to proclaim the gospel to the very first time. Who would like to read Galatians 3, 9 and 10? 9 and 10 in Galatians 3. Over here, on the left. Please. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with living in Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Thank you. Did you notice the dramatic difference here between two words in verses 9 and 10? What does faith bring? Bless. A blessing. What does works bring? A curse. A curse. Since the gospel is 180 degrees contrary to my sinful nature, how do I become a doer of the law? You're going to torment me this by not doing it. Is that biblical? Volunteer for Romans 9, 30-33. Romans 9, 30-33. Volunteer. Great. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which follow not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumble at the stumbling stone. You didn't think that was going to make this controversial a statement as I just did a moment ago without supporting it. <laughs> I've learned through the years. Yeah. I've got the scars to prove it. So what is the curse? Disobedience to God's law. Sin came into the world through one man. Romans 5, 12. Sin has death wrapped all around it. Without sin, there would be no death. Correct. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 56, what? The sting of death is what? 
sin. Why then are all who rely on works are under the curse? She just read it in verse 10. Because whoever does not abide by the works of the law, not by the works of the law, but keeping the Ten Commandments, is what? Cursed to do them. Now we have a dilemma here. So relying on works of the law does not mean that we're doing the works of the law, does it? No. Good. What does Romans 8, 7 say? I quoted it to you last week. I quoted it again. The carnal mind is enmity against God and not subject to the law of God. Wow. My mind and all of your minds since the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve chose to disobey are now contaminated with what? <laughs> Sinful flesh. The carnal mind is enmity against God. What does the word enmity mean? It's a war. What do people do when they go to war? They kill each other. The carnal mind wants to kill God. Amen. It is not subject to the law of God. No. And even if it tries, it cannot. It That's Romans 8, 7. So if I attempt to keep the law, what am I under? The curse. The curse. The curse. <coughs> So if I try to be saved by the works of the law, what have I just accomplished? Nothing. Remaining under the curse. Now, please understand, the Bible does not disparage good works, okay? In fact, the Bible encourages good works. It exalts them. Even since the Old Testament, God has been exalting good works. Who would like to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 11? Deuteronomy chapter 11, volunteer. Deuteronomy chapter 11 and read for us verses 26 through 28. Mary Jane? Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after other gods which you have not known. Thank you. Here's the word obey. What does the word obey mean? It's crucial that we do not associate the definition in English of obey with doing something. The word obey, again, the New Testament Greek means upakoi, means submit, subordinate your what? Will. Your will to God, which is what Jesus did when he was on this earth. Are we absolutely clear on that? Yes. Okay. So God is saying in the Old Testament, Behold, I put a what? A blessing and a curse. Okay. Now, I want to make sure that you recognize that God does not disparage good works. He encourages them. Who would like to turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10? Everybody knows Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved Faith and not of yourselves as a gift of God. Not of works, as I mentioned, folks. Very good. But we're dealing with here, what does God, why did God create us? Ephesians 2, verse 10. Who would like to read that for us? Over here, Tom. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So from the very beginning after Adam and Eve sinned, Jesus stood up and said, Okay, in Revelation 13, 8, I presented myself as an offering in the event that sin would come into the world. That instant, what happened? God began planning for each one of us to what? Participate in the good works that Jesus would make possible by his birth, life, death, and resurrection. Amen. Do we understand that? Yes. That is the purpose of life on planet Earth. To vindicate the agape love of God through us. Jesus has already done it. Now he wants for us to experience it to vindicate his name. What always in the Bible precedes good works? Jesus said it. 
Let's take a look at John 6, 28 and 29. John 6, 28 and 29. What always precedes, comes before, good works? John 6, 28 and 29. Volunteer. Great. Okay. Then say he unto them, I got 26, what did you say? 28 and 29. 28 and 29. Then he said, then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he had sent. Nowhere in the Bible do works precede righteousness. Nowhere, ever. So the moment you hear it, you know you're listening to the false brethren today of Paul's day in Galatia. And that is what caused this letter. Okay, we've learned. Who would like to read verses 11 and 12 now of Galatians chapter 3? I'm running out of time. I really need for you to, uh, if you're going to read, volunteer. If not, I'll do it. Over here, Patty. 11 and 12 of, of uh, Galatians 3. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is that for the just shall live by faith. But whosoever shall be saved by the law shall also live Thank you. We've already learned that the law has two functions. It is a transcript of God's character, but it's also a mirror for me to see what I look like in my sinful nature in comparison to God's character. Amen. So it has a double function. Now I have a choice to make. How do we become righteous? Romans 10.10 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth or the tongue, confession is made unto salvation. Amen. I would prefer for you to read it, but I just don't have the time. I, I'm just running out of time. So when the believer applies this biblical truth to their personal life, we now have what? A clear contrast between what? Works and faith. The results of works and faith. Quick, I'm going to turn to Romans chapter 4, and I'm going to read that to you to support what I just got from saying. Romans chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Here we go. Now to the one who works, now to the one who works, his wage is not reckoned as a favor. But it's what is due him. He's earned it. And what are the works of the law? Death, sin, in a spiritual standpoint. Five. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies who? The ungodly, his faith is reckoned as what? Righteousness. Righteousness. Praise the Lord. Okay. Now, the last two verses of our study this morning. Verses 13 and 14 of Galatians 3. I'm going to read it. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. 14. In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. But the law does not rest on faith. What does the law rest on? Subordinating our will to God's will. Remember Matthew 26, 39? For 4,000 years, in fact, up in heaven, Revelation 13, 8, when Adam and Eve sinned, Jesus stepped up and said, I am the propitiation. I am the sacrifice. Because our law says, Without the shedding of blood, there's what? No remission. no remission of sin. So he stood up. Now, 4,000 years later, he comes to this earth. He lives for approximately 33 and a half years here. He raises people from the dead. He feeds thousands. Heals the blind. Raises the dead. And now, in the Garden of Gethsemane, in Matthew 26, 39, he says, Father... If there's any way that you can get me out of this, please do it. What's happening here? His will is trying to take over. The nature that he took on in order to ethically and legally save me is now kicking in. The last 
But that's not the end of the prayer, is it? No. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, not my will, but I God. That's obedient. Subordinate. Submitted your will to God. Beautiful concept. Amen. And that's what makes us righteous. Submitting the will to God. Our faith is counted as righteousness. Our faith in who? Jesus' faith.